Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Doctor session tonight. I hope everyone is keeping safe after all of the crazy weather we experienced last week in North Texas. Thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. My name is Shelley Curian with SkyPass Foundation, and we are here to discuss telemedicine during the pandemic and beyond. I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker for tonight to you guys. We have Dr. Nicholas Galliopinakis joining us tonight. Dr. Nick is a movement disorders neurologist and associate professor of neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. He has been a leader in telemedicine for Parkinson's disease for a decade and has developed telehealth applications, including teleconsultations for DBS candidacy, tele-rehabilitation and telepalliative care. Education is another central focus of his career, including developing the first of its kind teleneurology rotation for neurology residents. Very cool. He also leads UCSF's Movement Disorders Fellowship. Dr. Nick, thank you for being here. We are excited to hear from you. We also have Dr. Shilpa Chitnis joining us tonight. Dr. Chitnis is a board member of SkyPass Foundation. and She's a movement disorder specialist and professor of neurology at UT Southwestern, and she will be moderating today's discussion. And with that, Shilpa, let us go ahead and dive right in. All right. Thank you, Shelley, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, so Nick, let's start with basics. Like, let's start with, you know, the origins, right? When you talk about something, you always like to trace the origins and the history of, of the subject. So why don't we start with what got you started? Like, you know, when did telemedicine actually really start and what, how did you get involved? Uh, thanks, Shilpa, first of all, and Shelley for inviting me to that. Um, and I'm, I'm really, uh, obviously, like mo most of the country, uh, we've been thinking about North Texas with everything going on. So I hope everybody's safe. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I, um, I've been at UCSF for uh, 12, 13 years now. And at first was there as a trainee and fellow. And uh, we, as a fellowship and our department, we partner with the San Francisco VA. And even, even 15 plus years ago, the VA has been actually one of the leaders in telemedicine. Uh, you know, that, that it's been part of their goals to have more visits for telemedicine because they have such, they reach every corner of the country, every urban or rural place. So, um, so the infrastructure was there, um, uh, but outside the VA, it's been really, it was really limited um, because of Medicare guidelines or state licenses and, and so it hadn't expanded much as much as technology had. Um, so I was really fortunate to have some exposure in the in the VA um, for half, half my job back then. And so um, and up until that point, about ten years ago, really all of the tele work in neurology had been in stroke or most of it. Like if you did a, a search for all the studies published, it would be much a lot of stroke. And then probably movement disorders and Parkinson's was the number two. I would say that it really came on came online literally, and um, uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think we can we have a lot of treatments uh, that uh, you know uh, maybe uh, that help our symptoms, and they're, they're, they can be complex and they require frequent follow up. And for people coming from very far away places, traveling to academic centers uh, frequently is hard. So I think it's and then, and then a lot of our uh, management and visits, even if we do have to do a more thorough exam, is visual. We can see the tremor, we can test things. And so I think we're fortunate uh, to have like a, a good match of what can be really managed well in telemedicine. And so we started doing that. Um, and uh, Ray Dorsey is one of the leaders in this field. Um, um, and he, he was doing a lot of the feasibility, meaning is it even possible to follow up Parkinson's patients um, um, uh, via video telelinks. And I think we all inherently kind of knew it was proving that and, and showing that patients like it as well uh, is important. So the first studies that I was part of, well, not the first, the second round of studies that were national scope um, that Ray was leading um, was uh, were, were kind of showing that and what a patient feel about it. And really it was pretty clear it can be done. Um, you can communicate what you want to do. You can evaluate patients pretty well, and then patients find it comfortable and convenient, and uh, and so forth. So, so I got into that, and then through work, I just recognized that this could be used in a lot of different ways. Wonderful. So, what kind of uh, you know when you started out, like what kind of a setup? Uh, you know, of course, uh, technology has grown. So obviously, you know, as technology gets better, I guess. But what kind of setup did you 
start out with and what kind of setup do you, would you recommend you know for patients to have because you know one of the challenges that we had uh, when we started this during covid was just patients couldn't get on or something was not working or cameras not working so how do you ensure uh, and what suggestions would you have even for our patients you know for for them to have a very good setup yeah i think um so back in the day 10 years ago um it's, uh, I don't know if Zoom was around back then, but there were other software applications and a lot of people tried to put all kinds of bells and whistles and actually just made it made it worse, I think. And it was confusing for patients. And and so, and I, I don't have any funding from Zoom. I'm not selling their product whatsoever, but it is pretty easy in terms of you click the video button, you click the mic and um, you get a link and you just click on it. You don't have to download software beforehand. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. And it's also, uh, user-friendly across different mobile devices and things. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's still problems with people in, in you know, areas here in California, way up in, in Northern California near Redding and Eureka, you know, especially if you're not in, in even more rural areas, the broadband is not great. And actually in those situations, we, we move to mobile technology uh, even more often. So if somebody has a, a smartphone, sometimes the cellular connection is better than the internet connection. So um, in fact, uh, we do work, uh, not, not currently, but in the last few years, we did work with uh, groups in Africa uh, doing uh, asynchronous, meaning they record a video and upload it and we can review it and, and so forth. And actually we found that mobile phones in, in, in really internet deprived areas are very helpful to do. So I think the take home message is that um, it is, um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of troubleshooting thing, but uh, things have improved from better internet speeds for more and more people, uh, the software applications and interaction in the, the, the interface with patients and providers is easier than it was, and then just trying to be flexible. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially what you're saying is you don't necessarily just need a computer. If you had a very good smartphone and, and, and a link, then you could definitely connect through that. That's, that's wonderful. So uh, can you comment on the feasibility of doing a Parkinson's follow-up? Uh, you know, you, you did mention a few things, but you know, like just walk us through how you would do a Parkinson's follow-up on telemedicine. Yeah, I guess, uh, first of all, I would say, and this is kind of uh, speaks to your last question as well, but um, some tips of making it easier. Um, so it, especially if the internet bandwidth is challenged, so, you know, closing other apps, um, so maybe if, if possible, only having the telemed app open. Um, definitely lighting is important. Um, don't want to be backlit. Um, I've had so many patient visits. Where, um, we, we always try to give them the tips beforehand, but you know, the window, I mean, the window here is behind me, but I try to have the brighter light in front of me. So I'm not, so you can see me and, and so forth, but there's all things like that. But, um, um, but yeah, I think for the feasibility of a, of a study, of a, of a um, follow-up visit, um, so basically I think number one history taking is, uh, obviously you can do that. You could even do that by phone. Uh, but obviously it's nice to have the visual, um, cause as a neurologist, just to let you kind of behind the scenes a little bit, we're always observing people, even when we're getting the history, we're kind of looking at their face, listening to their voice, seeing if tremors come out as they tell us their history. So I think that visual link is really important. So that's, that's that, um, and then, um, then the next part of our, our of any visit, once we get the history of what's been going on and the symptoms and how the meds are going, is an exam. And like I said, the movement disorders exam is um, pretty amenable uh, to telemedicine because it's so visual. Um, obviously, you know, as your doctors um, are checking your muscle tone and so forth, we can't do that um, over uh, without being there and, and holding your arms and moving them. But and then we can't do the pull test where we. Um, pull you from behind and see how you re respond um, in terms of balance reflexes. But really all the rest of the Parkinson's exam we, we can do. Um, and so going through that, and then there's some pointers in terms of, you know, um, having a space, Try if, if possible, it's not always possible, but if, like you can have a, like I am on my laptop, so you can kind of angle the camera up and down to see the, the hands resting on your lap and uh, moving in a different direction to be able to see your feet and see how you can uh, do the different motions. And then the last thing is just having um, an area, if possible, to to walk um, and have your neurologist see the walking. Um, I always tell our learners that um, it's really important that if if there's a history 
of, of lots of frequent falls and things, it's, it's definitely okay to defer the gate exam. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's good for patients to know too, if, if, a, if a doctor, if you do have a telemedicine visit down the road and they want you to walk, but you don't feel safe uh, walking at that moment, they will be very happy to hear that and, and not do the exam. So uh, you can definitely say, I don't, I don't want to do that right now. I don't feel safe on my feet. Because the worst thing that happened would be to fall because of something and we're not there by your side to do anything. So, um, so yeah. So I think that that history and physical part is uh, definitely uh, feasible. And then in terms of recommendations and things, um, that is a little tricky sometimes. We have to make sure what, uh, sometimes, what we've been doing is we type up our recommendations and either send it by the patient messaging and send the letters to your doctors. But um, when those systems aren't in place, that can be a little hard. So we try to do that. Yeah. And um, so are you seeing any new Parkinson's patients on telehealth or is it just follow-ups? Yeah, it's a great question. So for the last 10 years, we uh, UCSF, um, they, and we'll talk about some barriers to telehealth in a second, but they, well, I guess I could say them now. So one is, um, you know, uh, licensing. Um, so it, until recently it was in pot, you, I couldn't see somebody in Nevada or Arizona. Um, and I actually had patients that would live on the, on the Nevada side of Tahoe and drive over to California to be li literally in California so I could legally see them uh, as, with my California license. So that used to be an issue. Billing used to be another big issue that Medicare wouldn't pay for telemedicine except in very specific things. Um, and then, so, um, so, and then another thing at UCSF, they were allowing us to only see follow-up patients uh, by telemedicine because they weren't kind of comfortable with uh, new patient evaluations. So for the, up until COVID, um, those were the real restrictions on what we could do. So it had to be somebody I'd already seen before, couldn't be Medicare, which is unfortunate because it's a lot of our patients are on Medicare. Although thankfully um, UCSF allowed us to see Medicare patients. They just kind of ate the cost on that. Um, but now since COVID, we can see people across state lines we can, um, Medicare has allowed billing for telemedicine visits, I think in most cases. And, um, and then also to, to your question, um, we can now see new patient consultations. So that's that those three things are new since COVID. Yeah, I think it's the same here as well. Um, uh, so what can you tell us about, you know, some initial research studies that you've done in the field of telemedicine and can you tell us some uh, salient findings of the, that research? Yeah, I think um, the, you know, a lot of those research things are kind of descriptive studies and showing that it's possible to do and then kind of reporting on what we found the challenges and so forth what were. Um, so that, like, as you mentioned at the top, uh, we, we worked on those national studies with Ray Dorsey and all his colleagues. And then on our own studies locally, we kind of went to the next thing and, and kind of realizing where we could really not just use it for Parkinson's follow-up, but other um, therapies needed in Parkinson's. So, and specifically I was looking at things where um, you need frequent follow-up uh, uh, and, um, and also services that are so specialized that it's really hard to find in, in many places. So for instance, we have at physical, we have a physical therapist or two at UCSF that specializes in neurophysical therapy. So things like stroke and Parkinson's and so forth. So, uh, but that's not very common everywhere. So, um, and so, and then, and you also have to come in person very frequently. So a lot of physical therapies like every week. And so we developed some protocols with our physical therapists to be able to say, what, what did they feel safe doing when a patient's at their home? Um, so for physical therapy, another example is our mental health. Uh, we work with a psychiatrist in, in our clinic and, um, she's a geriatric, uh, psychiatrist, uh, specializing her whole career has been in, in neurological illnesses and the, 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 uh, mental health issues that come up. So again, that's a pretty rare thing probably even more rare than a neuro PT person. So, um, and then also very frequent visits. And so that, that was nice. And she's actually now that. Dr. Saratan, she's kind of run with that. And she has a full, I, I would say uh, even before COVID, uh, more than half of her uh, clinic was telemedicine um, for mental health and psychiatry. And then uh, in my own experience, um, uh, together with my uh, interest in telemedicine came this interest in palliative care. 
Um, and that's a whole different talk. But, you know, it, with palliative care, I mean, one could argue that we do palliative thing, meaning relieving suffering from the very beginning of Parkinson's, but certainly in later stages of Parkinson's, it's really hard to get to your visits um, from just so many standpoints. And so we had set up a palliative care clinic and it was probably at the VA and it probably had our highest no-show rate. And so once we convert it, because it's just hard to get to these visits. And so once we converted that clinic to palliative care, uh, to, to telemedicine, uh, that that return rate and show up rate like went went back to normal. Um, and so it just speaks to the fact that when it's really hard to get into these uh, visits, that telemedicine is really useful. No, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that you had also mentioned to me is you uh, were looking at these patients, uh, selecting them for deep brain stimulation for surgery, and you had a pre-surgical clinic on telemedicine. Right. So can you tell us something about that? Yeah, that was another uh, project, another example of um, that actually also came out of just my clinical experience. Um, at the VA, even before COVID, we, we had an exception to that interstate rule. So it's federal medicine. So you can kind of see patients from any state. And, and one of the strange things, our center of excellence at the VA stretches, our catchment area stretches from here all the way to Michigan. So we had a huge area of the country where we were responsible uh, for evaluating patients for surgery, for the deep brain stimulation surgery. And, and before we were doing telemedicine, we were, we were having them fly out to San Francisco. And then they would, if we thought they were a good candidate, they would come back later for the workup and, and maybe a time for the surgery. So uh, it was a little crazy. And, and especially in the sense we used it for a screening uh, method. Um, so you would imagine somebody coming from suburbs of Detroit, flying out to San Francisco. And in, in some instances, uh, you know, you can tell they're not a deep brain stimulation candidate in half an hour or shorter for various reasons. And, and you can imagine the frustration of a patient who's flown across the country and can, is told very quickly, this won't help you. And, and so we realized that we could do a lot of that screening uh, by exam and so forth. Um, that first screen to save people that trip um, by telemedicine as well. So we kind of developed a uh, paper, a, a study and published that study on, on a initial screening of candidacy by telemedicine. Yeah, and for the audience, I just want you to guys to know that uh, deep brain stimulation, as you know, is an advanced, uh, or even now, a little bit earlier surgical therapy for management of patients with Parkinson's. And UCSF is one of the top centers uh, in, in, in the country with uh, Nick and, uh, you know, Dr. Jill Ostrom and Phil Starr, and who are very world-renowned, uh, you know, people. So people fly from all over the country to go have their DBS surgery there. So being able to do the initial, you know, couple of screening things on telemedicine is certainly very useful. And, and then, you know, because I, I know people go to Gainesville, Florida, and they go make three, four, five trips, and that's just very inconvenient. So I think that telemedicine is definitely going to make that even easier. And I think that it's probably going to be here to stay, uh, you know, post, post COVID uh, as, as well. So, um, in terms of investment, like cost investment for the university, like is this a huge cost investment? I mean, for the patient, you know, like I said, all, all you need is you need a MyChart account and you need a phone or a computer. But for setting up this, is that a huge investment? You know, um, that's a great question because um, you would think it was uh, from two years ago to 10 years ago. Uh, they, there was a UCSF telehealth resource center um, and there was all kinds of things like what you have to have a license and you have to um, not just like medical license, but you had to get a software license through the university, go through this training, uh, figure out how to do the accounts and who had what and on and on and on. And, and then the whole regulatory thing. So it was very complicated. And then, like I mentioned, UCSF was just the costs of Medicare patients. So they just felt that that was an important thing to offer and, and so forth. But now with COVID it, um, and with the development of the software and stuff, making it much more user-friendly um, that we, we all have just the regular UC license to Zoom. And it was, a, it was really something remarkable. And, I, and it wasn't just UCSF. I, I heard about this all across the country, how quickly um, as COVID hit, you know, in March of uh, 2020 last year, um, you know, San Francisco was one of the first places to just completely shut down in, in California in general. And so um, it was really amazing how in, in two weeks, we just completely converted to 100% telemedicine practice. 
Um, and I think that's impressive for a couple of reasons, but also speaks to the ease with which a, a place can set up a program like this. I mean, we had our program already, but not 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 everybody um, did, and 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 so you could see pretty quickly places were um, able to convert and do that. Uh, another thing that happened with COVID is, um, you know, it's hard. I mean, uh, there's there's studies, Shilpa, you've probably seen these studies that neurology actually has some of the highest burnout. And uh, so private practice and neurologists are under a lot of pressure, economic pressure, all, all kinds of things. And so during COVID, a lot of, especially in the rural areas here, a lot of the, the clinics just shut down. They just closed shop and they said, we don't know how to help people and it's not, you know, and so forth. So um, we had this flood of places from Fresno and Bakersfield and, and, like, and the like um, that they're like, where did we get our prescriptions? We don't know. So we actually had, we did have a huge outreach and tried to bring, bring those people in too. It was, it was that was hard, um, but um, it, it was, uh, it was hard. Yeah, but I think uh, for, for patients, I think it was very gratifying. I mean, you know, the challenges with internet connections and, you know, a lot of our patients are older, so they sometimes are not very tech friendly and tech savvy. So those, you know, challenges were, were there. There were days when I wanted to kind of take my computer and smash it against the wall uh, because, you know, we can hear something, you can't, but, but as you said, technology has evolved. And, and the other thing is I think patients are starting to realize that this may be something that may be here to stay. And so the earlier that you basically, you know, make friends with it, it's probably like, you know, better for them because that's where medicine may be going. So, you know, we're still in, you know, people have, some people think COVID is over and, but it's not. And uh, we're still going to begin COVID probably in 2021. So beyond COVID, what do you, what do you anticipate is going to be the future of telemedicine once COVID is done? You think is, are we going to be using it same same extent or, you know, creative ways? Yeah, I think, um, couple things. Um, well, first to, to come back to the previous uh, discussion, you're right. We, we also had a, a person that worked in our office that was already used to coordinating telemedicine. So that definitely made it easier and troubleshooting and so forth. Um, but so that, so that, that was a little bit helpful. So, um, but yeah, in the future, I think um, you're right. I think the, like we already mentioned, the regulatory and, and financial barriers that we had to telemedicine that, that remains to be seen. I, I think it's gonna be hard to withdraw that from people once they realize how it, it is a nice tool to at least have that as an option. Um, so I'm hoping Medicare does not reverse um, the, the, the leniency that they've given us in terms of doing what we used to not be allowed to do. Um, so that's number one that we have to wait and see how that goes, but I think it's gonna be okay. Um, but yeah, like in, specifically to Parkinson's and how I think I'm going to use this going forward. Um, and this is not just from COVID, but even before COVID. I think the the best way is is a combination. Um, I just actually saw a new patient today, and um, I never met her before. Um, she doesn't live too far away, so and it wasn't exactly clear. She was referred to us for possible Parkinson's, and and she was not a very straightforward, clear diagnosis of Parkinson's. So in that case, I'm certainly not gonna start a medicine and, and so forth. So I asked her like, we'll hopefully see her in, in not too long of time, a couple of weeks or so to, to come in and do an in-person ex, um, exam and, and kind of figure some other things out. Uh, there was a reason to get an MRI as well. So we'll pull that all together and see her in person. Um, so number one, in terms of new consultations, there's always going to be a reason, many, many, many reasons to have people come in person. I think it's fine to maybe screen people remotely, like we were talking about, but there's so many instances um, where you need to do that hands-on exam or, or what have you. Um, um, but even in a straightforward, this is Parkinson's disease, or this is essential tremor or so forth, um, probably what we're going to see, especially for people who live farther away, is a combination of, you know, maybe your every three or four month visits are telemedicine, but we check in every six to 12 months in person or something like that. So I think it's gonna be a, a combination. And certainly, um, you know, for me also, I'm, <laughs> this is admitting my faults, I'm really bad about telephone follow-up and, and, and patient messaging. And so now what we do, and it, I, there is something about seeing a person that's I think just so much better than the phone. So I we've converted some of these more complicated kind of 
okay, you went up on your medicine and this side effects happened. When did it happen? Should we go back down? Should we try something else? That kind of thing I think is better uh, with a face-to-face. -face. So some of this quick follow-up stuff, I think I'm gonna start doing by telemedicine as well. But certainly a combination of in-person and tele is gonna be the future. Yeah, and I can say as a physician, uh, the fact that you know I didn't have to drive to work, uh, I only have clinic three days a week. So, you know, to, initially we were obviously doing um, every day was, uh, you know, the three days were telehealth, uh, but certainly you cannot do botulinum toxin injections uh, on telehealth and uh, DBS uh, on telehealth, although now DBS will, wireless DBS will soon, you know, make that possible. Uh, what do you think about uh, wireless DBS on telehealth? Yeah, that's interesting. So that is another future development that will pro is probably coming. Actually, as you mentioned, Dr. Phil Starr, he's our neurosurgeon and does a lot of innovative stuff. And he is now, we actually are already programming remotely. Now that's not a, a typically commercially available um, deep brain stimulator yet. That's in his, some of his research projects. Um, and, then, and then we have a lot of support. He has lab people, like the other scientists that know how to work and plug people into the internet and, and program them re remotely. But it is already coming out for research applications and probably someday remote um, things will happen too. Um, I would say it's similar to the rest of clinical things. There's gonna be some tune-ups and things we can do by remote programming. But I think initial programming, it's really probably, I still much, much, much would prefer doing that in person. There's just so much you can see by feeling the muscle tone and things. And for me in my deep brain stimulation programming, I, I probably hang my hat most on the, on the tone because that's something yeah. very objective. It's not like how big the patient and how much they're trying and so forth. It's something I can feel as I go up on the voltage. So I think in person is definitely going to have a, um, a, a huge role in DBS going forward. But uh, sometimes if we're in, and especially if we're making big changes, you know, you don't want to change, you don't, I don't want to change like the, the stimulation, you know, with, and this might not be general knowledge, but, um, with stimulation, there's some things that are small changes and some things where we totally change the shape of how we're stimulating or so forth. And I would still feel a little uncomfortable to make big time changes from 500 miles away and they lose the connection and they have a tightness in their arm or something. So I think for the easy titrations and things, maybe, but for the, for the bigger changes, I'd be hesitant. I agree. I think I share a similar view. Um, what about seeing patients for clinical trial visits? Do you think the, uh, you know, the CROs, like the clinical research organizations, do you think they are going to allow the, doing uh, clinical trial work on uh, telehealth? Yeah, that's um, so um, myself and mostly Dr. Tanner, who's a, a big leader in, in our field as well. Uh, we worked with some other uh, people actually in bone health to develop this um, study. And I won't get into the details of that, but it's called the Topaz study. And it's actually nationwide. So people in, in Texas and in the middle of the country are definitely candidates too. Um, if you look up Parkinson's Topaz, you'll, you'll find it. But um, it's really the first study of its kind where we can scale up from, you know, sometimes and even in academic centers, even if we recruited everybody, which is impossible, it's we get up into the dozens of patients or something like that. But this is our goal with this nationwide remote study is, is 3,500 patients. So it'd be the biggest. Wow. Parkinson's. And I think in Parkinson's, I wouldn't say is a rare disease. Some other things we see are rare diseases. And, and so doing it, doing a clinical trial or clinical research in one center is almost impossible. So um, having these nationwide uh, remote capabilities of screening people and enrolling them so people don't have to come in for visits just to sign consent forms and things. I think it's really has so many potential um, applications to really drive clinical research and expand, you know, as neurologists, Dr. Chitness and I are used to looking at like cardiology studies of 25,000 patients. And it's just like, oh my, how does that ever happen? But uh, it, it just doesn't happen in neurology. So we probably won't get to 25,000, but really getting up to more powerful studies to answer some of the pressing questions we have will be great, especially for things that potentially slow down the disease. So. Um. Is, is there any new technology, any future things that are coming up that you know in tele, telemedicine technology that would make things easier? Yeah, I think, and I know that you know about all these things as well, but I think the other 
basically merging uh, field is all the, the wearable technologies and uh, things like that. So everything from an Apple Watch to whatever other sensors, I think um, for a couple of reasons, but uh, it can provide really, really detailed objective data on how big people's steps are and how much are they tremoring and how much of the day. So there is studies now that, um, that you can wear a wristband and it can tell if it's a tremor or if it's a dyskinesia. Uh, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty good. And so that's a, instead of taking a diary, you know, we ask the patients to fill out these rolls of paper of like how they feel hour to hour. Uh, and there's been very well documented problems with that. But now you just wear something and it just logs how much you're on, how much you're off and other things too. Um, and so I think that kind of meshing that remote sensing technology with telemedicine and studies is gonna also be a big uh, boon to, to research and, and progress. Yeah. Absolutely. And so uh, uh, the reimbursements and billing are is essentially pretty much the same for the patients. Uh, it's not a higher cost for the patients with telemedicine? No. Yeah, they're supposed to reimburse at the same rate um, and, not, and definitely not higher. Yeah, I think that's something the patients will always be happy, happy to know. Um, I think, you know, um, we can switch gears and have some patient perspectives as well as some patient questions. So uh, firstly, uh, guys, thanks for being here. Um, I'd really like to, uh, you know, maybe call upon a volunteer that has done telemedicine and maybe share with all of us, you know, your experience and what you, how you thought telemedicine was from a, you know, we, we know it from a physician perspective, it would really be nice to hear from a patient perspective. So maybe a volunteer, uh, can step up and and tell us otherwise i'm going to call on some people if you don't if you don't volunteer i'm going to call on you if you want to volunteer go ahead and hit the raise hand button at the bottom or just put it in the chat box and i can uh, go ahead and unmute so that you can talk oh here we go yeah looks like we've got brenda brenda knew that if she was not going to speak up i was going to call on her I figured as much. <laughs> so um, I've had uh, Zoom meetings with Dr. Chitness um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I live north of Dallas. So my commute down to downtown area is an hour um, and not having to make that drive is fantastic. Um, so I've actually enjoyed having the meetings. Um, I do forget that I need to sometimes, like I need to do the walk and where I normally have my computer set up, I'm kind of tucked up way in a little corner of my room. And so um, I, need, I need to remember the next time when I set up to be in an area that's more open with more light so that when it's time to go through my, you know, the different things that I have to do, that I am able to walk, you know, through through the kitchen or something like that, where Dr. Chitness can see me better. So, um, but other than that, I mean, that's for me one of the best benefits is just not having to make that drive through crazy Dallas traffic all the way into downtown area. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Brenda, in terms of you know what I normally do at the end of a visit is we give the patients an after visit summary. And so, uh, but you know, on a virtual visit, what we've been doing is we put the information in the patient instruction section. And when you hit print AVS, uh, technology allows, actually that message is dumped is in as a my chart message. So have you had any trouble with that, Brenda? Have you been able to get all those messages with the instructions? Yeah, I mean, now you're kind of talking more along the my chart app, which is also very handy. Um, and yes, so everything we communicate through that, um, I'm able to send you messages, you're able to respond back to me, I'm able to see um, it, the summary of our appointment, our meeting, I can pull it up, I can download it, etc. So yes, it is very helpful. Um, and one of the things, you know, just before this meeting, we had our um, YOPD support group meeting. And uh, we were just talking about how UT Southwestern did a really good job of using that um, MyChart app to let us know that we could get our vaccines for the COVID virus. 
And once somebody told me that was available, I went and looked at my app. And I mean, there was the button, you just had to punch it, pick a date, which ended up being the very next day and boom, it was done. So that's really handy too. Yeah, I, I will say uh, not, you know, as an endorsement uh, because I work at UT Southwestern, but they've done a phenomenal job, uh, you, you know, using the technology and getting everybody connected. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree, it's been uh, really great. I, I think that the the key is is that you you have to have a good software like that be able to in conjunction with like these webinars or Zoom meetings um, because if you don't have that communication tool it makes it a lot harder. So my primary care physician has a different um, app that we use on you know on our devices. But I can't communicate to my doctor that way, and that makes it a lot harder. So that they have to go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, as a patient, uh, any challenges that you encountered uh, with the uh, telehealth format that you found were perhaps not as um, you were liking? Um, honestly, not at this point. I mean, I, it's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. But also, you're also an educated computer professional and have a very good computer and all the on the network and have the savvy to use it. Uh, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think that it is not so hard to teach even, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been teaching some of my patients on, you know, as to how to use it. So it's been, no, thank you. Thanks so much for uh, your information. Um, do you have anything else to say, Brenda? Otherwise, I'm going to read some questions. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for volunteering. Uh, this is a question uh, that came in from one of the attendees uh, for you, uh, Dr. Nick. How accurately they could assess, evaluate uh, a patient's motor symptoms, foot drop, freezing, tremors, lack of balance, et cetera, via telehealth? Some of the tests that my neurologist, uh, neurologist does are highly interactive, specifically the balance check, whether the doctor pushes you from behind and you push back. Uh, how could these tests be conducted remotely without the doctor being present? Yeah, like uh, like we said a little earlier, uh, definitely testing muscle tone and then all the details of the gait exam are two examples of where we we that's a gap that we we have that we can't do um, a good a, 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 as good as an exam as as in person. Um, and that's why I think for follow-up, once we have examined you and we can see what, if you're on or off meds and we can kind of, if we know you very well already, that, that kind of, uh, becomes less of an issue, but you're right in a new patient evaluation, when we're trying to figure things out, if there's a diagnostic question, it can, it can be difficult. And so, um, like we said, sometimes we just have to come in person, um, and, and so forth. But, um, yeah, I mean, the details of a foot drop versus a, a, a foot dystonia going down, like if we can't check reflexes and strength hands on, there's a lot of examples uh, that it would get difficult. Yeah. You know, conversely, there are some examples of people that um, with Parkinson's disease that maybe they've already seen a neurologist, you know, locally and started carbidopa levodopa and they had a great response. So even though I've only seen them by telemedicine, they they look like they have the classic presentation and a levodopa response, then there are many, many, many cases where we're like, okay, I feel pretty confident that um, this is Parkinson's. But it, that's another good point. After Parkinson's, a lot of the other conditions we see, there's only a couple others I would feel comfortable with diagnosing uh, via telemedicine. The other ones get complicated. And so um, uh, I think that, that it, it decreases how confident I feel for other things. Yeah. Um, so patient wants to know, I'm a Parkinson's patient since 2013. I do see my movement specialist regularly. However, I was encouraged to see a palliative doctor to discuss uh, the rest of my life. I'm 76 years of age. Would you suggest to do this? And if yes, uh, would you suggest to, uh, you know, what to do for telemedicine neurology? A telemedicine meeting, sorry. Yeah. Um... Certainly, I think if your movement specialist knows you well and thought that that was a good idea, I'm just, I mean, obviously don't know any of the details, so I'd probably um, trust that there, there might be something that the, he or she thought was important to address with them. 
um, even it, that almost sounds scary. Like, oh, why does he think I need to have a palliative care meeting or, or so forth? I don't think it has to be anything like that. I think we encourage people. We always say in our clinic there, we hope for the best, but we plan for the worst. So I even say, you know, I mean, I being a physician, physicians are famous for having their advanced directives. Even at 45 years old, I have my things and I've planned for everything just because I know that life can happen and, and be difficult. I always say planning is, is good. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the efforts that a lot of us neurologists in the Parkinson's field are doing are trying to think more broadly. You know, we're not just um, visits and medicines and surgery. Like, what are the other things that we can do to improve wellness and mental health and our quality of life? And so a palliative care specialist just has a different approach to some of those things. And I think really, I, I think a palliative doctor can really help so many people. So I think that if they thought so, I, I, would, I would definitely go for it. There's, there's nothing to be scared about. It's not, a lot of people get confused with what palliative care is. It's not hospice, which is like, okay, I'm very advanced. I'm going to you know, have a risk of dying in a year or something that that palliative care is very different. It's, it's really can be applied at any stage of an illness. So, yeah. And then telemedicine, I mean, that's, uh, that's like a specific thing that some people do. I mean, I'm sure palliative medicine specialists, uh, are doing telemedicine like all of us are. So they might offer that during COVID and, and maybe after. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did you say you are doing research on bone health? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the main reason Dr. Tanner and myself got involved is because we're both interested in these telemedicine applications and, and to the things I spoke about, like having a larger scale of patients getting involved in, in important research. Um, so that's how we got involved, but definitely bone health. Bone health, to me, since I've started working on this study and learning more about it, um, uh, interestingly, one of my first research projects ever when I was a public health, a master's in public health student, like 20 something years ago, was on osteoporosis and bone health, but totally unrelated. But um, I think um, bone health is an example of sometimes, unfortunately, with uh, primary care providers with Parkinson's, they kind of attribute a lot of what's going on to their Parkinson's and, and or they're worried about the Parkinson's so much and Parkinson's patients have a lot to deal with. And so sometimes other um, health issues get put on the back burner. And we actually saw that there's a very, Parkinson, patients with Parkinson's uh, get their bone health checked and get on the appropriate meds if they're needed at a very small fraction of what other people do. And so, um, so that's the number one thing we were interested in. And two, uh, obviously people with Parkinson's fall. And so it's possible that people with Parkinson's, even if they have healthy bones, might have more fractures just because they fall more and harder. Um, and so I think for, for all those reasons, we thought that that collaboration was very interesting um, and, um, and, and, and could be a big help to people with Parkinson's. The other interesting thing is some of these medicines for bone health actually have been shown in preliminary studies to decrease overall mortality. Um, and so that was really interesting. Why is that? So we're trying to have a subset of patients in the study and look at what, what that might be and will it help Parkinson's patients and their longevity and health, overall health? We don't know. Yeah. Um, can you also speak to the use of Apple Watch and how a person with Parkinson's and family member can use this technology it might be a webinar at some point. You did talk a little bit about it, but maybe you can just. Yeah, I think um, I don't personally have an Apple Watch. Sometimes I feel like I'm the only person in San Francisco that doesn't, but uh, I know there's so many, just like a phone, there's so many apps and things. So it's hard to speak to which app is going to be useful and so forth. I think an Apple Watch or a phone, actually, honestly, the biggest way I've used it is um, for my patients is. Um, that you can put all the, the timing for your medication alarms in there. And I think the watch has that too, but that's kind of rudimentary, simple stuff. But I think um, it can help us keep track of, um, you know, some of this would, you know, how a patient's going to use it at home. I think we're a little early for that. Um, certainly you could kind of monitor your steps per day and things like that, um, which could be part of a bigger, just general health plan. Um, but using it like specifically right now, it's mostly uh, whether a center has a very specific program or research project that they're doing. So it's a little early in the game for that. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, Nick, you know, obviously you and I are not inpatient doctors, but uh, you know, because you're in the telemedicine field, uh, you know, I have, I have uh, a friend who's an infectious disease doctor and now they are using telemedicine. You know, there's a lot of places in the country that are in remote areas that require a specialized consultant. So they are using a lot of telemedicine for hospital care. So what can you, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, I think there's two points there for sure. One is that I think we've been specifically talking about Parkinson's and movement disorders, but this, this issue of, you know, all the sub sub specialists that are experts in XYZ are all in the big cities and typically. And so that kind of subspecialty thing is going to become, I want to see somebody in Chicago or whatever, um, is going to become a, a more broader use thing for subspecialists to give that at least that first visit. Um, and then, uh, and specifically to inpatient, um, like I said, also stroke was the number one use of telemedicine. So in, in neurology, at least, uh, that was used from, for, I think a couple decades now, like having a camera in the ER, the neurologist is, is kind of far away and, uh, they can't, and, and also not to get into stroke too much, but, you know, time is brain is the expression. Like you need to get there and evaluate and treat very quickly. So the time that the neurologist gets in and so forth. So there are definitely inpatient uses for telemedicine as, as well. Absolutely. And I think those were all the questions uh, that the patients had and I had. So maybe uh, some closing remarks on this, Nick, uh, before we can let everybody go. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm biased. I, I've been using this tool for a while and um, it's, uh, you know, uh, obviously COVID has been uh, such uh, a tragedy on so many levels. And, um, but, uh, you know, historically over history, things, these really trying times sometimes kind of pushes for, instead of the gradual change that's been happening, it kind of pushes things forward very quickly. And so that has certainly seemed to happen with telemedicine and, um, do I want to see 70% of my patients via telemedicine in the future? No, I like to see them in person. And, but I also like to have that tool available for when they have to drive an hour to Dallas or for us, it's also crossing a bridge or two. So, uh, so patients really are not, uh, they, I, I, one of my, in one of my telemedicine talks, I have a, you know, I always do handwriting samples for our patients to, you know, and I, sometimes I tell them, okay, right. Today is a sunny day or whatever, but this person wrote, I hate San Francisco. <laughs> so it just speaks, it speaks to difficulty in traveling an hour in, in the Bay Bridge traffic and things. And it's, it's, it's definitely going to have applications that are gonna make uh, things easier for patients. And that, that's the reason we do this. And you know, you mentioned about physician burnout and it's very high amongst neurologists. And so one of the things I really found is not driving to work, like at least seeing you know, maybe one third of my patient population on telehealth has been very good. I mean, you know, you're just in your office and you don't have to get up too early. Uh, you know, you could be in your pajamas and nobody would care. You could be wearing a suit and then having, <laughs> which is, you know, funny. Uh, but uh, uh, essentially, I think that, you know, it has been good, I think, even for physicians, just not having the long commute, you know, because I have like a close to 20 mile commute. And, you know, it's uh, it's been pretty good now with, with with COVID, one of the advantages is not a lot of people on the road, but in, in the days when you are really traveling, you know, it takes about 45 minutes. So I'm saving about, you know, 90 minutes every day. And that really, I've been using those 90 minutes to work out and lose weight and be healthy. Does somebody have a question? It, yeah. Can you read it? I, I have, it's been over a year since I've seen my neurologist. Could I insist to see my doctor? Because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I mean, um, put a put a call into their office and um, like that most places, some places are, are able to see people more easily, even if it is just by telemedicine. I don't, I don't know what your, your neurologist is doing, but um, certainly over a year, we, we want people to be followed up more often than that typically. So I would call their office. I think we were only we were only shut down March, April, May, June, and then from July I think you know uh, we we started opening and uh, especially the Botox patients and DVS patients really uh, you know uh, needed to um, 
uh, get them in because they couldn't really stay without programming or without Botox, especially. But you know, to answer your question, Mr. Desai, the question is not uh, how far they are. I think the question is their comfort level on, you know, do they want to see patients in person? Uh, but now that you know, uh, all the physicians have been vaccinated and a lot of the patients are also getting a call for vaccination. Perhaps that can change and you know you should be able to get in an appointment to see the neurologist. So although COVID is not going to be over for at least a little bit longer, at least you know that gives you a, a little bit of a level of comfort, I guess, you know, having been vaccinated, right? Well, Shelly, you have any uh, questions or any comments? Um, I think I noticed that Lori sent us a chat saying that she has an Apple Watch and she's used the fall detection feature, which I thought was interesting. So David and Regina, to answer your question about how to use the Apple Watch specifically for PD, I'm not familiar with it, but apparently there's a fall detection feature. And I asked Lori if she'd be willing to speak to that for a minute. She hasn't responded to me. Lori, um, if you're willing to just go ahead and hit the raise hand and I can unmute you for a second if you want to speak to that, if you're comfortable. And um, Regina, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a great point. And like, um, like Dr. Nick said, still more research to be done there, but certainly we would be willing to explore that and do another uh, webinar series on that once the information becomes available. And it looks like Lori said she's willing to speak to that. So let me just unmute you here. And there we go. Okay. So I love my Apple Watch because I don't have to carry my phone around with me all day to get my alarm take my medicine and um, of course it tells me to get up and tells me to breathe <laughs> and um, with the fall detection um, you, you put in all the information the emergency numbers and and everything and so but it will call you before it calls emergency services like you know you can say you're okay or you do need help. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the fall detection. I, I actually, I totally forgot about that. Um, uh, so is that, that is, an app? Uh, well, it's, it's really a part of it. You have to activate it. Um, but I think they all come with it, but you have to enter the information. Hmm. Great. And I also have AFib, and so it's able to take an EKG, and that's helpful for uh, when I go see my heart doctor, I can just show um, her the data. Yeah, I do have the EKG. I have to look at the fall detection one. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Okay. Well, Thank you, Lori. And uh, that's it, Shelly. Says they're interested in the sleep app as well. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. We'll certainly look into that. And if you guys have any other ideas or questions um, or any unmet needs or topics that you'd like to cover, please let us know. We want to make sure that we are serving you in the best way possible and speaking to topics of interest. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, Dr. Nick, thank you so much for your time tonight. Such great oh, thank information. You. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. We look forward to hopefully having you on again soon. Dr. Chitness, thank you for moderating the discussion and for your time as well. Take care, everyone. Have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Nick. Good night. Stay safe. Bye. Good night.